Hello, Namaskar and a very good evening to all the viewers watching our session out there. We are watching this particular session on PM Evidhya channel number 6 to 12. Viewers, throughout our live interactive session, you can also connect with us through our YouTube channel that you all know. It is NCERT official. So it's around 4 p.m. on your watch and regularly from 4 to 5 p.m. we come up with our special sessions to enhance your understanding about diverse fields. So once again, a very warm welcome to all our viewers in the third day of our online training on digital pedagogy. As you know that we have been conducting these training sessions since past two days. So let me just take you across the journey of the sessions that we have already completed. So on the first day, that is on 25th of July, 2022nd, we discussed about digital pedagogy, the concept scope and the policy perspectives associated with it. Then yesterday we discussed about engage learners digitally. And today the topic for the third day on this online training session is navigate responsibly. Now, what are we going to navigate responsibly in this particular session? You'll get to know more about these sessions. But the primary objective of this session is to integrate the digital pedagogical practices in the process of teaching and learning to enhance and enrich your classroom experiences. And providing us guidance in this session, we are joined by two guests in the studio. So let me introduce them to you. In the conversation we have with us, Ms. Shraddha Rawat. Namaskar, ma'am. Namaskar. Good evening. Welcoming you with open arms in this session, ma'am is Associate National Project Officer at Teacher Training UNESCO MGIEP. Then in the conversation, we are also joined by Ms. Renuka Rotela. Namaskar, ma'am. Namaste. Good evening again. Ma'am is also Associate National Project Officer at Teacher Training UNESCO MGIEP. So you must be wondering that all the people we have with us, the experts, they belong to UNESCO MGIEP. For that, I would like to inform you that we are running these training sessions in collaboration with UNESCO MGIEP. It is the organization, the Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. And it is UNESCO's Category 1 Research Institute. It focuses on Sustainable Development Goal 4.7 towards education for building peaceful and sustainable societies across the world. So throughout our live interactive session, that is for one hour, if you have any of the queries, then you all know that you can contact us at this contact number that is flashing on your screens. It is 8800-440-559. Besides, we also have a mail ID that is our help desk mail ID. So feel free <coughs> to reach out to us at this mail ID. That is training.helpdesk at the rate ciet.nic.in. Before introducing our first speaker to all of you, Ms. Renuka, I would request, uh, uh, I would request you to please allow me to take our viewers through your work, through your areas of interest. Please, please. Okay. So she's Ms. Renuka Rotela, and uh, ma'am works in the field of education and has worked for the last 13 years in the same field. She has developed and implemented large-scale programs on global citizenship, education, and social and emotional learning. Besides, she has a majors in physics and education from Delhi University and Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She also worked as a science and math educator, instructional designer, program manager, teacher trainer, and researcher. Wow, we have we love you <laughs> for this particular area that you are associated with uh, maths and educational areas and program manager, teacher trainings, Thank and you. what not. <laughs> her specialization lies in technology-driven program transformation. And she is currently guiding her energies on the areas of teacher well-being and adult learning. So I think you are the perfect fit for this conversation <laughs> where awesome. we are going to discuss how we are going to navigate responsibly. So why not begin this conversation? Thank you. Thank yes, you, you may. So hello and welcome everybody for today's conversation. And in today's session, we are going to be navigating responsibly. And I think that's an important question to address. What are we navigating responsibly? So today, we'll be focusing on how can we use web responsibly? And before we begin the session today, uh, I would also like to invite all the lovely teachers who've joined us and all the people who will be joining us later for this session uh, to also be like a little child. So what that really means is that we invite you to be curious, we invite you to join us in this session with an open mind. So to, to just help you understand what that might look like in today's session, uh, we will be having a lot of reflection questions, uh, deep introspection, and we would invite you to be aware of how you're thinking in those moments and how you're feeling in those moments. Uh, just 
get that awareness to what that really means to you. Secondly, uh, we also want you to be here with us with all your attention, uh, purposefully guided towards what we'll be learning today. And lastly, if you have any burning questions or any burning thoughts that you wish to share with us, then please use the chat and the comment section uh, to share your thoughts and your questions. We would love to hear more from you, learn from you, and uh, respond to them to the best knowledge that we have. So let's begin by quickly doing a short recap of what we learned uh, in yesterday's session. Great. Uh, if we can have the slides on the screen. <clears throat> All right. So before we dig into this, this third session, a very quick recap like Renuka said, what did we cover yesterday? So yesterday was a session on Engage. And we were talking about how we can use digital tools, technology, digital pedagogy to engage different kinds of learners. So the first thing we spoke about was identifying differences in learner. We talked about the importance of observing our learners, understanding their different needs, preferences, uh, their different styles. You know, so there are many different ways uh, in which learners differ from each other and we spoke about understanding those differences and catering to them. The second thing we spoke about is three strategies to engage learners. If you know what CDC means, put that down on chat. But uh, for others who may not have attended yesterday's session, um, uh, if uh, uh, the uh, CDC implies choice. So these are three strategies to engage different kinds of learners. At the same time, the first one talks about offering choice to learners. The second one talks about varying levels of difficulty and supports. And the third one talks about collaboration. So consciously building in collaborative activities so that learners feel more engaged in the, in the classrooms, etc. And we also then spoke about how digital tools and tech-enabled methods or activities can help us build more choice, offer different levels of uh, difficulties and supports and also offer more collaboration um, within the classroom. So that's what we did yesterday. Uh, it was a very exciting session. Uh, but today we are going to focus on uh, internet. And we're going to talk about the world wide web that we are all now part of. And uh, our focus would be on how as teachers we can use the world wide web, the internet, Two, one, meaningful, uh, bring in more, uh, enrich our classrooms, innovate with our pedagogies, at the same time talk about how we can use it for our own professional development. So that's going to be exciting. It's a whole, it's a new angle of looking at technology, one, within what we do in our classroom, but what we do outside our classroom to enrich our professional practice. So that's what we're going to do, and I want to uh, invite now Renuka to take this conversation forward. Thank you, Shraddha, for beautifully articulating the purpose of today's session. And I hope uh, that our audience now understands what we're going to be doing today. So with that, I'm going to also request our, our presentation to be on. Uh, so on your screen, in a few more seconds, you should be able to see uh, the next slide, please. Thank you. So on your screen, you should now be able to see uh, a picture. And I want you to take the next few seconds to, uh, to analyze the picture, decipher what it's really trying to communicate to you. And in the meantime that you do that, let me also build a little context. So this is a, a, an image from a movie that was released in 2019, a popular movie, Bollywood movie, Gully Boy. Uh, perfectly all right if you have not had a chance to see it. Uh, but as of now, right now, we can lo simply look at the picture and see what it's trying to communicate to us. So the picture says roti, kapra, or makan plus internet and internet. And uh, perhaps a lot of us are familiar with the first part of this, this dialogue, which is Roti, Kapra, or Makan. This was a very popular movie growing up. It was a classic epic movie in the Hindi cinema. Uh, and it stuck with a lot of us, right? It connected with us because it was suddenly talking about these three basic essentials of life. But 2019, when this movie was released, it suddenly appeared like we are establishing internet as almost equivalent to a basic necessity, or perhaps for some of us, if I'm not wrong to say, then maybe slightly uh, over that and above that. 
Now, how does that really transform? If you look at pandemic, right, 2020, we all were stuck back home. The web kind of emerged as a really strong super character uh, in this entire narrative of pandemic. For the first time, perhaps we all recognize that uh, online and web could create a space for all of us to socially connect. So we were physically isolated, but we were socially connected through web. It gave us an opportunity to be vulnerable, to like to share our worries, to share our concerns and fears, uh, and to ask for and seek for help, right? It also, for many of us, it provided opportunities to work across continents. In fact, we realized another way of working, a new modality, the work from home modality. Uh, that still a lot of organizations are continuing to follow. So it transformed the whole nature and culture of how this world uh, was just existing. And for a lot of teachers who are joining us, uh, we also recognize that, that many of you also translated online very quickly. Uh, you used the web to do sessions to ensure that your learning, classroom learning happened. So you went on Zoom, you went on Teams, you used different kind of portals and platforms to engage your learners. You started curating um, digital content uh, for learning to become more valuable and meaningful for your learners. And you really experienced that. And I think hats off to all of you. We, uh, I think it's worth appreciating that the quick transition that we all showed. But also acknowledging that moment, right? Uh, maybe let's, uh, yeah. Also acknowledging that moment, I want you to take the next few seconds reflecting on this question. So now as an educator who's translated online, uh, as an educator who's experienced some of these tools, uh, how would you say you are doing in terms of using the opportunity that web has to offer? So on a scale of one to five, if you were to rank yourself, then what would that score be? So maybe you can use the chat button uh, to help us know what are you feeling about this. And as you do that, uh, let me also take you to a story. So a story is going to be an essential pedagogy for our session today. So let me take you on a story uh, of a teacher and this is an inspired story by the lovely teachers that we work with. And this teacher happens to be uh, Mr. Uh, Arif Sheikh. And Mr. Arif Sheikh is a teacher of biology in a government school in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, and he has been transforming learning and he has been transforming lives using the World Wide Web, the internet. And the surprising fact, if I were to tell you, is that if you met him six years back, he and you said to even integrate a YouTube video in his class, he would be sweating and he would run in the opposite direction. And something changed, but something changed. And I want to shed a little light on what something changed. So one fine day, six years back, when Mr. Sheikh was in his class and a kid walked up to him and he said that, you know, yesterday my sister, who's much older than me, she showed me um, a tool. She showed me an application where I could actually, it was a 3D application where I could actually hover around the phone and I could see how the muscles function and, you know, how they, where they're situated. And I could look at the human anatomy. Uh, and for Mr. Sheikh, uh, you know, that was a moment when he was a little curious. And when he engaged with, with this, uh, this student, he realized that he ended up saying, the student ended up saying, you know, you've been teaching something for the last one week and yesterday was the, the day when I actually understood. So that became a moment of, of shame also for him, but also a moment of curiousness, as I said. And he really wanted to explore the tool. When he explored the tool, it was really hard because this is a person that we are saying literally has uh, really low uh, ICT skills and he didn't even know how to download the application. This is a time six years back uh, to a time that when he really got that tool inside the classroom, he thought that this is going to make his life easier. Now, whether it made it easier, we'll talk about it later, but what eventually happened that all the kids from the class ran towards the phone and they started hovering the application. And for the first time in 15 years of his career, he saw that aha moment that all the teachers are always looking out for. 
So he could see that it, his kids had immense joy in, in their eyes. Uh, they were too excited. Uh, and it also showed in the next unit test because everybody ended up attempting some of the questions correctly on, uh, on that particular topic. And that was a moment of trans uh, trans uh, translation. And when he realized that technology and integration of, of online resources can completely transform classroom spaces. And cut to today, uh, he has been able to connect to numerous other uh, portals, numerous other platforms. He's on Facebook, connected a lot of people, learning from teachers around the world on what can be integrated, how can it be integrated, failing at times also. Let's recognize that there's going to be failure, failure failing at times also, but trying hard and succeeding. And today is a day when his classrooms have integrated different kinds of applications. He's using not only applications to teach, or to, or to search a, a content, but also is integrated applications inside assessments, is integrated applications uh, inside a classroom for collaboration. And today is the day when right now as we talk, he's actually working on a platform which can help health workers in a remote part of India to, uh, to work on nutrition and uh, needs of students from underprivileged backgrounds. So technology can be transformatory web can become transformation. It's only a choice that we have to make, the step that we really need to take. And maybe we can also quickly, yeah, quickly look at uh, what we see on our screen. So these are some of the ways in which you can integrate web inside your learning spaces. Some of these, the ones that you see in with the yellow circle, are the ones that are, uh, are Mr. Sheikh uh, explored in his class. Uh, using uh, web as a medium to find information, using web as a medium to instru instruction, using you know Zoom and Teams as platform, <coughs> using that for learning, which he clearly did in the example that I shared with you today, integrating them in assessments. And if you look at, at beyond the classroom space, because who we are as individuals are not just teachers, right? We are also human beings who want to learn, who want to grow. And if you, uh, what he has been able to do is to actually nurture an entire community to be able to connect and collaborate and grow with any other teachers from around the world. Uh, and there's a long way to go, right? But this is a great start and we truly appreciate uh, what Mr. Sheikh has been able to, to achieve in the last six years. And I'm sure we have a lot of Mr. Sheikh sitting there in, the, in our, our live as well. Yeah. I also want to add, Renuka, to this bit you're saying, you know, Mr. Sheikh's story is reminding me of stories of so many other teachers who've shared their own experience of what all they've been able to do with mm. on the World Wide Web, especially professional development. I think, you know, that's one, that there are so many teachers who, who, who identify opportunities on the right. web for whether it's training, also these days there's, you know, there's Google certified educator, etc. So there's certifications etc there's also collaboration with other teachers from across the globe yeah. that that's so easy to do now so etc it's reminding me of all of those teachers and i want to um, emphasize on couple of other things that one teachers can do in the web uh, uh, using the internet i think you spoke about you know the transition that teachers have had to do sometimes i feel like we are all in it struggling you know in a way we've been chosen you know, there are shifts in the education system that happen and this is a century long. Ideally, it might have taken 50 years to get to the state we are in for this kind of online learning to happen. So in a way, we are also blessed. This batch of teachers who are right now teaching, we've had to, like, we had no choice. We had to adopt technology and we had to conduct online classes. So in a way, we are also torch bearers right now because what we are doing right now with technology is going to impact what teachers after us are also going to do. In a way, we are setting norms, the new normal. And I think my uh, urge to the teachers viewing this would also be to think of themselves as leaders. What you do will impact what happens in your school even after you leave because you're setting a new norm now. So, you know, how do we think of ourselves as then innovators? Of course, we can sulk also that you know we've had to struggle so much and learn a whole different thing uh, to be able to do the job that we've always been doing but there's another way of viewing it what else can we do and the fact that you are in this training to get today 
watching this training means you are wanting to learn you know better ways of doing things so i think you know just to give you a couple more ideas around what is it that we can do online so uh, especially i i want to talk about collaboration one that the fact that teachers across the world have their blogs they have their instagram twitter id etc we can connect with teachers who are interested in similar things than us perhaps just send a post say let's connect let's do things together there is a teacher that i'm reminded of who's actually doing a project on sustainable development with another teacher in another country they are both doing the same projects and then getting their learners to interact with each other on what they are learning or uh, what have they created together so it's that kind of cross country cross national you know a uh, chat can be so enriching and that's something that internet allows us to do to get outside the four walls of the classroom bring in an expert or bring in a child from another country and open gateway to the world you know expose them to the globe being in the classroom so that's one thing that definitely comes to my mind but also social impact you know how do we take what children are learning in their classroom beyond so taking up real world project for instance starting social media campaigns and many learners have done it while you know designing this course uh, that uh, we often talk about the digital pedagogy i came across so many resources especially this video i'm reminded of on digital etiquettes that is created by teachers and students together so they've done a project they've learned something and then the teacher student come together to create what they have learned and they are giving tips to other people on the world wide web on what what makes a good comment what are the things to avoid but also to do as people respond uh, you know to 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 posts etc and we'll talk about that aspect as well today but you know just creating resources and yesterday we were talking about there being so many quizzes assessments already available online are we just consumers of that information or are we also creating it so you know to be able to to have to realize that we have the power of creating and sharing resources that may be useful to other educators across the world so you know that's another thing that uh, you know internet has made possible for us to utilize resources created by other teachers whether it's slides sharing them on you know sharing our slides that we make on sharepoint sharing the quiz we make on uh, on quizzes and other websites so there are so many possibilities uh, on the internet that we can use and today uh, you know because there are so many possibilities and uh, uh, there are also a few skills that we need to have to utilize these possibilities so i want to talk about today you know since we have limited time in today's session we are going to talk about three of these skills and i want to tell you again uh, you know that there are multiple skills that we require to be able to effectively use the world wide web but today we talk about how is it that we can build a positive digital identity also why should we care about building positive digital identity and maybe even what it really means uh, we also then talk about digital etiquette so what does that really mean and how do we practice digital etiquettes in the in the in, in when we are on uh, the world wide web we also lastly talk about misinformation i think this is a pain point we have on internet because communication is so easy now that you know what what should we trust uh, is this information that we get is it is it is it true not true should we share it beyond so we also talk about how can we identify misinformation uh, in today's session uh, so moving on to talk about digital uh, identity what does digital identity really mean you know in the real world we all have our identity right and what is that based on it's based on our actions so what we do how we speak etc you know that determines our identity people identify us as a b c kind of person attribute certain qualities to us very similar to the real world is the digital world is the world of internet where our actions which means what are our actions on the on internet it's what we post online what we like online how we respond online all of this thing also what we view online all of this together everything we do online creates a sort of identity this is our digital image it is it is our digital reputation 
So when someone is online and looking for, they type my name on Google, they will see a bunch of things. Maybe there's a Twitter account, maybe there's an Instagram account, maybe there's Facebook, maybe some website mentions my name, some YouTube video opens up. All of what they see together is going to form an identity. Okay, and that identity is what uh, is called digital identity. I think the first thing to talk about is should everyone have a digital identity? What do you think? Do share your responses on the chat. What, what you think about digital identity? Do you think you as a teacher need to build a digital identity? But to just share with you a couple of things, a couple of my thoughts on digital identity is, you know, the benefits of that. I think in this day and age, uh, there, are, there, there are people connect with other people a lot of times if they don't know you. A lot of times what people do, and you may have done it yourself, is to look you up on the internet, to know who you are. So, you know, just to be able to connect with more people and to be connected, to be approached by other people, it becomes very important to create a digital identity, which means to share what we are doing in the classroom. You are all doing wonderful work, but sometimes we feel very hesitant, you know, posting something. We've done an experiment in the class and it worked. We designed a beautiful activity. It worked in the class. But will we share? Some of you may be great at it. Some of you may be sharing like these experiments. Do we share it online? And we'll see, I think in India still, people share lesser than others. In, 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 in a lot of times, the resources that we look for, it's, they come from West. Teachers feel much more confident, you know, even if they've done something really small, a tiny activity, feel confident posting it on their social media. So I today want to encourage you to start doing that too. You never know who you may be able to inspire as you start posting it online. So in digital identity creating, it is important to make these kind of collaboration, to inspire other people, to provide meaningful opportunities to other people. It's also important to make an impact that you care about deeply. So to post things, you know, issues that you care about, to share that on social media and then Perhaps sometimes it just converts to a campaign when there's more support for it. Uh, it also it's also important to positively influence recruitment and admission. You may be um, uh, perhaps not even surprised to know how many recruiters these days look up people's LinkedIn profile and Facebook profile, etc., to understand their professional work. So you know it's also very critical from a recruitment point of view. And these are messages not just for us as teachers, but also for our students. Can we communicate to them the importance of having a digital identity for you as teachers, but also for our students, for them to be careful about, uh, you know, what kind of identity they are building and uh, to build one, to build one, uh, this kind of identity. As we build our identity, though, there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. And I think that's what I, I, that's a segue. I think I'd like Renuka to talk about what are the things that we need to keep in mind as we build our digital identity, which means as we start posting messages, responding to messages, what should we keep in mind? Renuka, your thoughts on this? Yeah, of course. But before that, we have few reflections on a digital oh. identity from oh. our viewers. Like uh, Chandra Bhanji used to say that uh, everyone must have digital identity for professional growth and enhance the learning experience, okay. which makes it more interesting mm. for the people around us. And Diki Ji also says that it gives us a platform to reflect our inner personality, mm. uh, which make easy for others to approach to us, especially our children. They can see a real version of ourselves apart from a classroom teacher. Now uh -huh. that's coming from a teacher. That's, that's so beautiful. So that point about you know the personal connection that mm. sharing something that from you know outside your role as a teacher if you can share it really builds a personal connection with the students as well so also thanks. it also makes our classrooms more like less formal yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. can be more interactive with the teachers yeah. when they are on instagram yeah. facebook yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact you know honestly um, so I left school a uh, really long time back, four mm. years back. But I am actually connected to most of my kids through Instagram and mm. Facebook. And we still continue to talk. So I am also grateful to the fact that, you know, there is an opportunity for mm. me to still grow with them. So now these kids who were in grade 8, 9, they're now in college. So a lot of, the, a lot of things that I get to know about them is just through that medium. And it's mm. just so honest and authentic. So I do see and I'm so glad that we've had such like 
intuitive and such honest responses of, uh, of mm. to the reflection question. So maybe with that, as Shraddha uh, rightfully pulled out that as we are on the web, right, there are certain skills and tools that we might need to better navigate it. So maybe we'll start looking at, uh, again, we'll use a story. And uh, because a few of you said that, you know, making the personal uh, connect helps. So we've got a little story and I don't know how well it's uh, visible on your screen, but maybe I can read that out for you. So let, just building some context, this is a teacher who's Mamta and that's her name. And she is a teacher just like you and I. Uh, she wants to be, she's like a budding influencer, influencer teacher, and she would wants to create a space where teachers can come together uh, and share things that are working for them, to be, to be honest, to be authentic, to be vulnerable. So she's trying to create that space for herself and for many other teachers out there. Now, this is something that she posted and this is an experience that she had. Just going to quickly read that for you. So she says that my students have been upset about a recent change in school policies. So today, instead of doing our usual class, we heard each other out. And to that, she just, you know, that the day ends and next day when she wakes up, she sees a lot of comments. And some two of the comments that we picked up out for you, you can clearly read. One is the comment, one which is like, like almost celebrating Miss Mamta and, and, you know, also sharing that how dialogue really helps for us to connect, how it helps to build relationships. And this should be an exercise that we should be doing across the school. And there's another comment, and please remember these are opinions. We are not looking at what is right and what is wrong here. But there's also an opinion which says that, you know, we should not be wasting our time on such silly things. Uh, we should be focusing on completing our curriculum. And uh, in any case, the, it's the school management who knows uh, what is better and what is good for students. Uh, and these ideas should be something that you should completely refrain from sharing on uh, the internet. Now let's do a moment of reflection. Now having heard these two comments, and if you were Miss Mamta, waking up to these comments, how would you feel if you were to read comment two? So maybe I can, uh, I'll also invite some of you to share that on the chat. If you were Miss Mamta reading a comment that's uh, reminding you of what your job is and what you should not be doing, uh, then how would that make you feel as somebody who wants to influence and transform education uh, sector in this country. And this creates an opportunity for us to also talk about etiquette. So just like if you and I were to meet in person in real life, right, uh, we would have certain norms, we would have certain etiquettes that, that we will agree on, that we will all value and we will all also practice them. We also have etiquettes for the digital world, which are called as the digital etiquettes. And the objective of it to, is to really, you know, look beyond that, that few pieces of lines and look beyond that few pieces of, of blog or article or post that you write. It is to really see the human in you and it is to value that human in you. So what we are trying to associate when we talk, when we say about digital etiquettes is also to see that somebody, there's a human being right behind that who's typing their opinion, uh, an authentic opinion. And as we interact and engage with that content, we also need to be mindful of what we are posting and how we are posting. And just to also establish that here we are really not talking again about what is right and what is wrong, right? We are talking about, you may disagree with somebody's opinion and I think that is true for all of us, right? We, re, we see so much content online, we see uh, important people, we see, uh, we see people like us uh, sharing something online. We might disagree with a lot of them, but how we choose to engage or how do we choose to communicate really matters. And that's where the entire uh, place of digital etiquettes comes in. And of course, I mean, there's a lot that we can talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have so much time to engage in that. But I think something that I want to also uh, uh, remind or maybe reiterate is that this is going to be normal. This is unfortunately the web is going to be like that because we don't have etiquettes which we have uh, set up for all of us, right? And that's going to take time. But in the meantime, please don't feel discouraged to uh, to not share or to not create your digital identity because refraining from that. Uh, has a lot of drawbacks 
But if you do create a digital identity, if you go out there and share what you feel like personally, professionally, you also build opportunities. And I think Shraddha has already articulated that in the previous slide and so have a lot of you shared on the chat that the opportunities in engaging are much higher. Mm -hmm. So what are you willing to let go is something that you will of course have to evaluate for yourself. But people here, uh, I mean people who have been working with teachers, we can certainly communicate that there are so many opportunities for you to be just out there in the digital front. Mm -hmm. And Shadda, yeah. maybe if you want to add something to that, like... On, the, on digital etiquettes, yeah, I think I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's really about, uh, you know, there's so much uh, research in, you know, how hate speech is growing so much on internet, etc. It's very easy, you know, when we see a post to say, I don't agree. Or, you know, to just say that uh, this is very, this is such a silly thing, silly idea. Because sometimes, you know, we don't realize that, we know, but we don't realize that behind that profile is a person. And how would they feel when they receive a message like that? So would we behave like this if they were right in front of us? And that's what I think, Renuka, is, uh, you know, you're trying to say about just being mindful uh, of of the person and their emotions behind the screen. So yeah, I think that's digital etiquettes is about that. Sometimes something as simple as, you know, writing everything on caps, it reads like it's, you know, <laughs> is that a shout? Is that, you know, something, yeah. can't you read it? You know, it may have implications. And we may be doing it unconsciously. So there are a couple of things like that, nuances that we need to keep in mind as we interact, participate in the online space. Yeah. Yeah, I think Shraddha beautifully put that uh, and again just a reminder to everyone that how important it is to, to create this identity of, of yours and how important it is to be also mindful of what you are posting as well because I remember we when we were having a conversation we were also talking about the unintended audience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like many a times we post and on different platforms I'm saying, maybe on, on Facebook, Instagram, it's a much personal platform mm. and you want to post something but we also need to check in with us that who all are viewing my uh, my account uh, is that what I want to show to them also and being really mindful of that so that a level of awareness mm. is a great starting point to engage digitally and I'm sure if you engage with that space then your challenges are going to be much much lower uh, than if you were to just uh, right away uh, you know run into that so with that maybe you know one of the other essential uh, tools I think which we also need to talk about and it is a point of worry and a concern for all of us in wherever, whichever space we are is also misinformation. So I mean we all are on family WhatsApp groups, right? We all have uh, these groups where we are bombarded with, um, with such WhatsApp messages. For example, this one is just talking about a virus twinkle which is in the air. Uh, this is a WhatsApp forward and now it's saying that it's spreading through water and if anybody touches your water, wherever the source is and if they're infected, then you're infected. Now those are somehow sometimes the kind of WhatsApp forwards that we receive. And in this moment, as an aware digital citizen, right, it becomes our prerogative, our responsibility to check in, to see what is the source of this information, right? How true uh, is the source of information? And maybe before we go into some of the tools that we need to know, again, a quick reflection for, for all of you. Now, if you were receiving that WhatsApp message about many such things, right, uh, what are you going to be doing? So are you going to be sharing with friends and family? Because that said beware and word of caution. So it showed urgency, right? And this is health that we're talking about. So are you going to be out there sharing? Are you, are you going to be ignoring that? Because it really doesn't impact you, honestly. Or third, are you going to be that digital citizen who's going to step up and is going to say, wait, before I send it ahead, I'm going to verify this, right? And if you have opinions about this, please do share with us on the chat. We'll happy, be happy to learn more about it. And this also provides us an opportunity to talk about uh, how can we tackle misinformation because it's just so common and we can't really ignore that. So maybe Shraddha, we want to... Yeah, there are certain tips that may help us. You know, sometimes it's not easy to uh, uh, figure out whether something that we're reading online is true or not. So a couple of tips that can help us figure this out. And uh, this, this is, it takes a bit of skill, but just want to leave you with some hands-on uh, ideas that may help you. 
So this is a model called SIFT by Mike Caulfield <coughs> that uh, represents four different words so, uh, and steps, uh, uh, practices that can help us identify what is misinformation and what is correct information. So S refers to stop which means stop before you forward something or before you believe something and think before you share an information that you just came across through WhatsApp, through internet, through email, etc. So the first one is to stop and know that not everything that I see online is true. That's step one. The second one is investigate, which means what is the source of this information? Now, if online I'm reading up something, I find some information, do I look at who is publishing this? Is it a credible news channel that is saying it? Or is it some random person's blog that is saying it, right? So to understand what is the source of that information, where is it coming from, is another important thing. And what you can do for investigating is if you see some content on a website and, you know, of, of, an, of a news channel, but you've not heard about it, Google the name of that news channel to know whether the news channel is, uh, is a credible news channel or it is not, right? To just maybe look up Wikipedia page of that news channel, Wikipedia page of the organization that is publishing that information. So these are certain things that can help you figure out whether the source is trustworthy or not. So that's the second one on S, investigate. F <clears throat> refers to find which means find trusted coverage. So sometimes all we want to verify is the claim that is being made on, on online, you know, saying that all of these birds are now extinct or that like Renuka was saying, the virus is spreading through water now. So we don't want to know what the source is or we don't even have information on the source because it came to us on WhatsApp. We want to verify whether the claim being made, the information being shared is true. What we can do at that time is open a couple of new tabs and write down the same information and see who all are reporting the same information and are those websites credible or not. So see how many people are covering the same story and then we get to understand uh, you know, whether, whether we can trust that information or not. So that lateral search for the same information can also be very helpful. So that's F, find. The, Fourth one is to trace original source. Now this is connected to a very common rampant phenomena where you know sometimes images and this happens a lot in the political sphere, ki these two ministers are now coming together uh, and then they are forming another party or that they are going to uh, uh, you know uh, um, leave one party and go to another. Sometimes they will have people handshaking. Now that image may be from five years back. But it is being shared right now in this context and then there's a message to that story. There's a story being created. So when we find an image like that, to then search that image, you can use Google image search to see whether that, where, where is the, where, what is the original source of that, mm. uh, you know, um, uh, of that image or of that story. So that's about, you know, there are a couple of these fact checking habits that can help us figure out whether an information can be trusted or it cannot be. There are also fact-checking websites that can be very useful. Times, uh, Times uh, uh, News Channel also has a fact-checking website where they not only provide you news but also highlight what are the fake news that are going around. Uh, so, you know, identifying these fact-checking websites can also be very useful for checking uh, misinformation. So, uh, I yes, think... Of course. I think that our viewers have taken a note of all the important points that have been mentioned by you in this conversation. And we still have around 7 to 8 minutes left. But before proceeding in with the questions, there are some beautiful reflections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some messages them. in the comment section. I would like to read them out. So, Nandlal Chohanji says that digital etiquette is the electronic standards of conduct or procedure. And digital technologies offer many benefits to individuals and society. Indeed, that's correct. And uh, Midhavi Sharma says that, well, uh, in the first place, I like to talk to the individuals personally and make them understand that why I chose a particular method hmm. to make the classroom scenario more engaging. Then we have it from Shikha Mithalji that exchanging views online, getting responses from others for communications to build digital identity is really very important. Hmm. Well, all your comments, all the beautiful messages, that means a lot to us. So keep writing to us about your queries, your views. So here it's the time for Q and A. Yeah, if you allow me, so we'll start with a very simple one. One of our viewers have asked us that while surfing web, 
whenever they are going for some Google search or something. It includes some unwanted pop-ups, advertisements, malicious websites, viruses, the content that I don't want to see. So in the first place, how to get rid of them? I, you know, the fact that internet is free, these, these things come with it. Mm -hmm. It's a whole big package that comes to us. There are so many third party tracking, uh, monitoring, you know, uh, these things, Imagine some things that we cannot get rid of. So I think, uh, you know, there is a, you, the fact that it, it is going to happen. One is to just accept it, but sometimes we are not, uh, we are often not aware what is an ad and what is an actual search. So I think those are certain skills that we can have and there is a, you know, we can also, so close some ads, it may not appear as an ad that's flashing, but it will still be a blank box. There are things like that that can help us, but I don't think there's a way of getting rid of them completely. So that's yeah, my... Yeah, I mean, you can block it and I've had like embarrassing moments inside the class. Yeah. And suddenly something pops up and I'm like, and I remember this so concretely and yeah. I said, Oh my God, what do I do? And I was like with grade 10 students uh, and, and I don't know how it happened. But what I did in that moment was also, of course, to, to just settle in. Um, uh, but also what I did later was, you know, try to block certain advertisements that I was checking on. Of course, I might have searched on something, you know, long time back, but I wasn't expecting them to be coming this way. Uh, so blocking it. So there is, uh, I mean, there, if you just look at the ad, there is a possibility where you can block it and you can also uh, uh, yeah. really select an option as to why you don't want to see that ad at least for uh, why doesn't it make any sense to you so I think those are things yeah. that we can try especially in the emails I know that you know sometimes uh, the emails uh, they, when you get like messages from websites etc you can definitely unsubscribe yeah. because they fill up your inbox yes. very fast yeah. so you can unsubscribe to not get advertisements and updates from yes. companies yeah. So talking of uh, internet as an introductory segment in this session so one of our viewers have asked your suggestions on from which classes should we ask our wards to start using internet for the purpose of education on their own? <laughs> it's surprising that this question has come up in all three sessions. Yeah. You know, yeah. it came up in the first, <laughs> at what age should we start? And we Parents respond. are very doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think it's coming from either a space of fear or also yeah. realistically observing the addiction that children have of, of screens. So maybe there is that happening, but you know, I would say, uh, is it, are children in your uh, experience already not Googling stuff that they want to know? So mm. it's whether we na help them navigate through that journey, if we don't help them, they're going to do it anyway. In, mm. in, it's not true for all the places, I'm sh I'm, I know, I'm aware that in many parts of India, internet connectivity is still a problem, so uh, not talking about that. But just I think uh, because they are already getting into it, it is important that we provide the right kind of skills to help them navigate through the web more uh, responsibly and more safely. Okay. Uh, very quickly, uh, we'll take you across these questions. We are left by the last three minutes and we have two questions to share. Okay. Well, this one is an interesting question. So one of our viewers have asked us, my mother working in a household manner, maybe should be a homemaker and uh, always busy doing the home codes. So, should she have a digital identity? Is it necessary for her? <laughs> I would like to respond yeah. to that question. Yeah. So, okay, so I don't have much context about it, but mm -hmm. just reading to what you have mm -hmm. uh, shared with us, and I'm going to question you as to why not, right? What is the opportunity for her even as a homemaker? And I know so many homemakers, in fact, my own mother, my own mother-in-law, uh, who've actually used web and you know literally uh, so I, I can share an example it's a personal example my mother would like always complain uh, to both of us you don't have any time for us and um, and uh, and I wanted to meaningfully engage into something and she loves cooking okay uh, and she loves reading on news and certain kind of news uh, so and she was always a little apprehensive of a smartphone she said you know again she had a fear of Technology, I got internet, I don't know how I'm going to be using my time properly. But cut to today, you know, she's one of those most active people who will be actually a fact, fact checker for everything. She's using that to learn newer things. She's using that to uh, to interact with people who are just not in her community. So I feel that there's, a, there's again the opportunity cost, right? There's so much that you can learn in whatever that you're doing. It doesn't have to be always yes. about a job, you know. It could be like I'm making karai pari in a certain way and maybe somebody else is doing in that, that way. Maybe I can connect with them maybe you can collaborate maybe you know everything does not have to be for a professional front mm. it can also be like a personal way of of just connecting 
uh, so, and knowing what's yes, happening. Uh, very world, quickly, yeah. I would like to have a one line of view for this question uh, that internet has given women an identity to come out of her bubble. Maybe starting a cookery channel and English learning mm. classes, but there are certain people who discourage them mm. and keep on reminding them their traditional task. Now, how should women deal with it? Oh, that's it. <laughs> At an intersection of many things. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. You know, sometimes people say that when you hear, get hate messages, a lot of celebrities are told that, but just learn to mm. ignore it. I feel that in such cases as bystanders, if someone is getting that, it's also our responsibility to support the people who are sharing something that's positive. So I think, you know, women have to, I mean, one, of course, we have to know that we are, when you move against the grain, then there is obviously going to be repulsion. You yeah. know, there will be resistance. So to know where it's coming from, that people are the way <laughs> they are, there will be some people who may not like the work. But also as other women who are viewing that, to support women who are mm. doing good work. I think that's something that you should to, so to, to know, like their posts, to share them, retweet them, etc. That I think gives power to women. Yes, yeah. Yeah. so more power to women. Yeah. And I think one more thing that I would like to add, because as a recipient mm. of something, of a hate comment, right, it can, re it can really off guard you. But I think we'll also learn over time but i think some of the things which have worked with me personally uh, and i've 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 seen which are cherished also is the place of awareness you know like sometimes when we receive a hate comment mm. uh, we uh, we really want to understand what is it making you feel sometimes it's just making you upset and sometimes it's making you really annoyed and the intervention to it right then really depends on how it's making you feel if it's making you sad perhaps the intervention is going to be changed, maybe much course, more decide. Of course. And if it is much <laughs> higher, then you will have to Thank you so much that. for that detailed information. And uh, pardon me for intervening in between That's because okay. we are not left by much time in the conversation. We are already there. Uh, thank you so much, Shraddha, ma'am, for guiding our path for these three days. Thanks a lot, <laughs> And we have two more days to go. And thank you so much, Renuka, ma'am, for thank being a part Sinran. of this conversation. Thank you, Thanks a lot, thank you to all the viewers who have connected with NCRI for this particular session. As you all know, there's an important news for all of you. Tomorrow is 28th July, 2022nd. और कल हम विश्व प्रकृति संरक्षण दिवस मनाने जा रहे हैं और इस उपलक्ष्य में लेकर आए हैं आपके लिए खास कार्यक्रम तो कल तीन से चार पीएमई विद्या चैनल्स पर आप देख सकते हैं हमारा ये कार्यक्रम जिसमें संगीत के माध्यम से हमने प्रकृति के संरक्षण के प्रति जागरूकता फैलाने की कोशिश की है आप इसका हिस्सा बन सकते हैं और अपने व्यूज और अपने विचार हमारे साथ साझा कर सकते हैं पुनः धन्यवाद करना चाहेंगे आपका इस सत्र में बने रहिए पीएमई विद्या चैनल्स में नमस्कार